All right, everyone. As I said before, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Sarah Lebarski, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. And for nearly three decades, the Hall has worked to educate and inspire by sharing the stories of Connecticut women. And their powerful stories, along with many of our educational resources, can be explored in our virtual museum at cwhf.org. I hope that you all have the opportunity to go and check it out. Our conversation today will be a half an hour as our others have been followed by 15 minutes of your questions. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during this webinar by clicking on the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. Our goal is simple, a virtual gathering to talk about today's important issues. And we hope this will be a useful source of information while offering up helpful takeaways. We are honored today to have as our guest, Karen Jarmok, who is a results-driven leader, experience in transformative change and policy impact as a nonprofit CEO and a former elected state representative. She offers a track record of leading organizational change that has dramatically improved service delivery, increased funding, and strengthened messages across various systems. Karen is currently the Chief Executive Officer at the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, where she is responsible for nearly $18 million budget and partnership with 18 sister organizations to include 400 advocates statewide and help to nearly 40,000 annually. Karen is a recognized decisive leader who navigates and simplifies complex, ambiguous issues and harnesses data and analysis to outline systemic challenges and deliver solutions. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. So before we begin and getting into the meat of our conversation, um, can you tell our listeners about the Connecticut Co Coalition Against Domestic Violence, what its mission is and how it's set up and functions statewide? Sure, that's a really great question, uh, and I'm often asked that question. Uh, many people don't realize there is a state domestic violence and sexual violence coalition in every state across our nation, and that's hugely important when we're talking about addressing the issue of violence against women across the country and in our communities. Uh, so the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence is, uh, we say, a membership organization. Our members are the 18 designated domestic violence uh, provider sites in the state of Connecticut. And when I say that, what I mean is that wherever someone lives uh, in Connecticut, there is always a resource locally in their own community to help them. Um, and it's a domestic violence organization where they are, uh, there are advocates working 24-7 uh, in multiple platforms around legal advocacy in court, uh, uh, in shelters, uh, in rapid rehousing programming in communities and doing support groups uh, and, and assisting victims and survivors in all sorts of ways uh, to help them to reach safety. That's wonderful. And, and who, can, who can ask for help? And can anybody ha ask for help? Services are available 24 seven. They are fully confidential. In the state of Connecticut, there is a statute that um, provides for that full confidentiality. So I know sometimes people are afraid, understandably, especially within uh, undocumented populations, what that might mean to reach out to an entity for help uh, and have a conversation. And these conversations are fully protected by statute. Um, also, the conversations occur with a certified domestic violence advocate, so you'll always speak to a live person, and it's always a certified counselor who is very skilled around trauma and safety and risk um, and helping people to get to their next best place. That's great information for everybody to know. Let, let's talk about domestic abuse and power and control. How do, you, how do you define domestic violence, and what are some of the misperceptions about it? Sure. So domestic violence, most importantly, is a pattern of behavior. Uh, and it's a pattern whereby one individual in an intimate partner relationship tries to take control over the other. Uh, and it, it really appears in multiple forms. And I think that's what's so complex about domestic violence. And uh, sometimes it's hard for people to grasp the full uh, breadth of what this uh, circumstance can look like for someone who's going through it. I think that for many, they believe domestic violence is that black eye, that broken limb, uh, and it can manifest itself into physically abusive behavior, and that does happen. 
But quite honestly, what we also see very often is the circumstance where that individual is trying to control the other with uh, threats, maybe they're verbal threats, uh, harassment, uh, economic abuse, perhaps controlling all of the finances so someone really can't leave that relationship. Domestic violence is also about isolation, uh, isolating your partner from others who might be their support system, whether it's family, friends, coworkers. So as you can imagine, for someone who's going through this, uh, it's, it's a very difficult circumstance. It's, it's, never, uh, it's never easy. Um, and it's usually multiple things. So it's, it's not that it's one thing and, and not the other. Um, they're usually all of these strategies that an abusive partner might use to try to intimidate and harass and control the other. One other thing that I wanna say about domestic violence is it's absolutely a pattern of behavior. So you might recall back in 2014, there was a, a professional football player, Ray Rice. He played for the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, and he uh, assaulted his fiance at the time, uh, Janae, uh, in an elevator and it was televised. And uh, it was really frustrating for people like me and others who work within this field to hear the Ravens and Ray Rice define this as a mistake. This was almost like a one-time thing. It was just a mistake. He's very sorry. It's never that. It's always a, a history, a pattern of behavior that really manifests itself over time. Great, great information. So can you talk to us a little bit about the unique implications that a stay-at-home order offers to individuals who are experienced domestic violence? Sure. So the stay-at-home orders, understandably, are uh, for our public health. Uh, so that we are not spreading this virus and keeping ourselves safe. But it's really created this interesting conundrum for victims of domestic violence who are now being uh, told and needing to stay at home uh, when their partner uh, is abusive and controlling um, and harasses them. And, and, and that is incredibly weary and sometimes dangerous. Uh, and uh, what we also know is that we're hearing that uh, from about a third of the individuals who are reaching out to Connecticut's domestic violence hotline, they're grappling with many of the things that we're all struggling with, right? Whether we're trying to work with our kids around online learning, whether someone's lost their job and you're stressed around that and your basic needs are, 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 are being um, uh, challenged uh, and uh, just trying to get their own job done at home. Um, but then when you add in that additional layer of a partner who is, really uh, making you walk on eggshells, uh, not wanting to keep the kids quiet because maybe they're working, but then you're trying to work. Um, it's really a very difficult situation. What we also find is that this might be hesitant to reach out for help. They might feel that they have to weather this because if they call for help and law enforcement puts that uh, 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 abusive partner out of the house, for example, that that might have implications around their, their financial security uh, temporarily. It might make that person more angry. So it's really, really difficult and complicated. And we've been trying our best to do a tremendous amount of outreach during this pandemic. And we appreciate opportunities like this to talk about this challenge. That's great. I, I know that a lot of people, we can just um, talk about it a little bit here. Many people, obviously, we're not talking about during the pandemic, but why do people stay? This seems to be a big question. And why, and maybe talk about why we shouldn't judge those who do. It's a really another really good question. So there's a lot of reasons why victims stay. And, you know, what we try to also say, and I'm so glad you asked this question, is why does he use violence? And when I say he, I say that knowing that in most circumstances, men are the abusive partner. We know that men though can be victims of domestic violence. So we just want to put that out there and, and, and let people know that men can absolutely uh, be victims and can receive help. But um, women in particular stay for multiple reasons. They love this person. The, the relationship maybe at the very beginning was wonderful. Um, they're hopeful that it will return to that. Um, perhaps he's sorry, it won't happen again. Um, and perhaps they have a family together and children and they, that's, that's complicated. Um, maybe their family is not that supportive. And so they are really struggling with how to leave and, and, and how to do that safely. We know that when someone leaves a, an abusive relationship, it's the most dangerous time. And so for some victims, I know this might sound strange, but it's easier to stay because they can monitor their safety in a different way. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they might be financially unable to leave. Uh, so there's lots and lots of reasons why uh, victims and survivors choose to stay. Some choose to stay the entirety of that relationship for their lifetime. Others choose to leave. Um, but what we know is that domestic violence can become uh, very dangerous uh, very quickly, and we uh, want to always make sure that people know they can get help. That's fantastic. Great, great information. Um, so why don't you give us an overview on the data, like before, during, and, you know, potential recovery period of the pandemic, just things that, that you know, uh, Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence is finding, and what are the trends that we're seeing, and et cetera? Uh, so at the start of this pandemic, uh, domestic violence shelters in the state of Connecticut, and we know that shelters is, is, is a very important element of safety for survivors and victims, but it's not the only piece of safety that's offered by these uh, domestic violence organizations. But the shelters in Connecticut in particular were at 130% capacity. And when we say that, what we convey is that there are often families uh, who are both sharing a room or individuals sharing space in a shelter or uh, families are put up in more of the general spaces to make room to accommodate safety. But we knew because of social di distancing, we needed to do something about that and quickly. So uh, we brought uh, safely and quickly um, the level of individuals in shelters to capacity, 98%. And then we were able to safely house families in hotels. Uh, and that was through some philanthropic support and also uh, some support from some of our uh, federal funders. Uh, and then uh, what we also do is we tapped into something called domestic violence rapid rehousing. We have a project in the state of Connecticut which provides a rapid rehousing. And March 1st and today, there have been 40 families who have been rapidly rehoused uh, with these dollars into safe um, apartments um, and permanent living spaces uh, so that they and their children can be safe. Uh, what we have uh, also seen is uh, calls for service and we, to law enforcement. So law enforcement uh, data around arrests we don't have, but we know that call, calls for service have actually decreased by 4% statewide. So we know that we can expect perhaps there might be more domestic violence happening, but there, therein lays that hesitancy perhaps to reach out for help. Uh, and so we're seeing a 4% decrease. We were really seeing huge outreach is to the uh, CT Safe Connect, which is the domestic violence um, resource and hub. All of the 18 domestic violence organizations, their localized lines feed into CT Safe Connect, uh, and that's seeing a hundred percent increase from March to April. Um, that's enormous, and that's a number. A, a lot of people reaching out to talk with a counselor. What's really critical about that resource is that uh, victims are. Uh, connected to a domestic violence organization and a certified advocate right in their community. The other side to the pandemic that has been really, really challenging is the criminal justice system. So traditionally, when someone calls law enforcement for help and there's an arrest, uh, we know that that individual is generally taken into custody and held in jail until their arraignment the next day. Understandably, law enforcement is not keeping people and holding them uh, in, in jails because of social distancing and concerns around the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, the other side to this is we know that courts have been closing. There are 19 locations went down to six and they're not open every day. So arraignments aren't happening as frequently and then cases are being continued to summer because offender programs have been suspended. So within our system, we've been very actively thinking through and strategizing around how to keep uh, individuals safe who are in these circumstances, given all of these changes that are happening. Wow. So um, we just, we, we touched a little bit about individuals reaching out for assistance. Um, can you talk to them about, and, and, and I'd like you to get a little bit more into the Connecticut State, uh, Connect, uh, CT Safe Connect, Connect. Mm -hmm. and um, the details about that, but also, what can people expect in terms of responses from adv advocates in the system? So CT Safe Connect is a hub, uh, it's a resource for help, access to help, uh, triage, uh, and most importantly, it links the individual who contacts Safe Connect to the, a local domestic violence organization. And that's that network that I was speaking about earlier of the 18 sites. The beauty of Safe Connect, which we launched in uh, November of 19, 2019, 
85% of the advocates on Safe Connect speak Spanish, and uh, the remaining advocates speak multiple other languages, Portuguese, Haitian, Creole, French, uh, and they are there to, to talk with someone either through texting, through email, through live chat or phone. We are finding statistically that individuals primarily reach out by phone. Uh, and through this pandemic, what we've also shifted is to something called remote advocacy. So um, while help is available now, it's available tomorrow and ongoing through this pandemic and onward, uh, for the temporary time right now, because of social distancing, advocates have really shifted in amazing ways and been very creative around how to connect with survivors and victims. Uh, so they're doing uh, virtual conversations like this, they're, they're texting, they're doing FaceTime, they're calling. Um, uh, interestingly, a number of the domestic violence organizations have done their support groups uh, via Zoom and thought that there might not be great participation and it's been amazing. Uh, everyone has still continued to get that support. And I think that goes back to how isolating domestic violence can be and how isolating the shut-in can be just for anyone. But when you're a victim and you're struggling with these other issues, the connection that you will be able to have with an advocate to know that help is available and someone to talk to anytime you need that, especially through CT Safe, Safe Connect, is really important. K Karen, just um, uh, can you talk about how if somebody, um, if any of our listeners or anybody that they know would go to their website, what happens if they need to get off quickly off of the site? That's a really good question, and I should have mentioned that. Uh, so the one of the first things the advocate, uh, and again, it's a certified domestic violence advocate always on Safe Connect. It's never, uh, uh, it's always a live person. And so they will talk with you about how you can quickly uh, erase any record of that conversation, whether it's by, on your phone or your computer. Um, they will be able to show you and talk you through. That's part of the technology that we invested in so that your, uh, if your partner, uh, which they tend to be uh, controlling, perhaps jealous, monitoring uh, some of the things that you're doing, you'll be able to hide that. Um, and that's a conversation that, or a contact you're, you'll be able to have without them knowing. Yeah, I went on to the national site the other day and um, I pushed that button to see what would happen and it took me off to the NBC News or, you know, it takes you yeah. to the yeah. place and erases. So that's wonderful. Yeah. So how has advocacy and systemic approaches shifted during this time, like maybe through the online restraining order application process, things like that? So, um, Advocacy is re primarily remote. There are still uh, an, uh, some uh, skeletal staff of advocates who are uh, appearing in court uh, when necessary. They're still going into shelters. Uh, they're always though connected, uh, whether it's through phone or through email or through texting, whatever that might be. But we've had to make changes like every system. And so uh, what's happened uh, in particular is the state of Connecticut, the governor put in an executive order to allow for rest online restraining order applications. And we really advocated for that when uh, court started to close because we knew that it would be really difficult for victims to get to court um, when their courts are further away and there's fewer hours. So for example, uh, they someone can just go to ctsafeconnect.org and they're able to um, work with an advocate and the advocate can submit the application for them, then work with an advocate in your community to have that um, order served, and then get ongoing safety planning and support from the advocate um, in your community. That, that's, uh, thank you for that. I just wanted to ask you one more question about advocacy for people who are wondering or don't know, when they go, let's say they go into a domestic violence agency to be helped, does that advocate stay with them through anything that they might go through? You know, like going to court or what types of, um, do they stay with them through the entire process, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Um, absolutely. And we know that there are victims and survivors who work with an advocate for years, for decades, um, because uh, domestic violence is something that can continue to creep up, especially if you might have left your partner, but you share children in common, so therefore they use other strategies to try to control you, mm -hmm. threaten and harass. And so um, I think it goes back to talking about earlier in terms of the restraining order process. Someone in their gut might feel they need a restraining order, 
um, and an advocate is there to talk with them and help them through that. But then let's talk about your housing. What, it, what, it, what is it, where are you living? Is that a safe, stable place for you? How can we help you? Let's talk about um, the follow-up hearing and, and how can we help you prepare for that? How might we meet you there at court? Um, we can talk with them about um, safety plans. You know, let's, everyone needs an individual safety plan. So I was going to ask you about that, that uh, Karen, excuse me for interrupting, but can sure. you talk just a little bit about what a safety plan is so people understand it? So a safety plan is a very individualized plan. So for example, for someone, it might make sense to apply for a restraining order. For someone else, that might just uh, instigate the anger and make them less safe. Uh, and so it's always a conversation with an advocate to really think through what is your best way to stay safe. Um, and a safety plan might also mean for someone, well, what are my plans? If I am financially uh, not able to leave this relationship right now, then what's my plan to get to that place where I can? How do we think through these things? How do we map this out? And, and then the advocate is always there to ongoing support them through that process. <clears throat> Excellent. Excellent. So let's talk about action items for people. What are some of the things that individuals can do if they're at home during this period and experiencing domestic violence? If you could go over a few things, I mean, you, we've talked a lot about it, but if we could just go over it again, maybe you would have a few other things you'd like to talk about of what they could do. Sure, um, and there's many things they can do and there are things that people around them can do. So getting to the isolation piece, how might that person be able to stay connected to those people around them who are their support system? So while we have to stay home, um, they can A, have a conversation with their family, their friends or their coworkers who it might be important for them to know, uh, I'm really struggling, uh, I'm walking on eggshells, I'm afraid he's going to uh, blow up. And so to be able to know that I can reach out and have a FaceTime conversation, that we can see each other and be able to talk to each other and perhaps get some cues from one another. You can have a, a, a conversation on a porch um, or a front yard um, where you're social distancing from each other, but it just gives you that opportunity to connect with other people and not feel isolated, perhaps go for a walk. In really extreme circumstances, it might be that the people around you know that there's some type of a code word, if you start talking about a bluebird, it's just an example that you might decide if I start talking about that with you, that means I need help. That means I need you to either call law enforcement or to come over and, and, and help me with this situation because I'm struggling. But would that, are, would, that be, would that be part of their safety plan? Like if they had children or something like that, if mom says bluebird, then they all meet at a certain place or... It could be. Um, what I want to be careful of is it's generally not that dramatic, um, but it can be. I just, you know, honestly, I had a conversation with uh, someone the other day. I, like many of us, I get calls um, from people looking for some guidance and help, and um, they, were, they were walking on eggshells in the house, home uh, with both people, home, uh, both partners home, and, you know, children. And, you know, the other suggestion I had was to make sure, you know, have the social security cards and the birth certificates, have a bag packed, have things for the kids packed, just in case. You just don't know if you'll have to leave quickly. It's generally not th that dramatic, but it can be. Um, but the key thing is for someone who's feeling uh, threatened and unsafe where they are to know that either CT Safe Connect is there and an advocate in their community to be helpful and or their family and friends and coworkers are resources where they can just reach out and stay connected with them throughout this period. Thank you. You touched on this a little bit, but so if, if individuals, if they think they suspect someone is suffering from a domestic violence situation, do you have any, um, we have about three or four minutes left here, five minutes. Um, do you have any um, advice for them um, about how they could maybe help someone suffering from um, domestic violence in their life? Absolutely. I would say, A, be patient. Uh, because going back to what I was talking about earlier, this is really complicated. It's never easy. Um, it's never the same. So what might seem for you or I, gosh, why doesn't she just leave? Um, it's, it's much more complex than that. So patience is really important. Um, the ability to make sure that person knows that you are there for them 
Uh, you'll be there for them today, tomorrow, and ongoing. Uh, when and if they are ready and that you are there to support them in their decision making. Uh, and uh, to flip side, what I was speaking of earlier, check in on them. Uh, drop off some cookies on a porch and ring the bell and stand back and, hey, how you doing? I'm just checking on you. Um, do you want to go for a walk one day? Uh, do you want to FaceTime one day uh, through email to check on them? Just, just determine ways that you can ensure that they know that you're a lifeline for them if they need it. And to recognize that they're going through a lot and they're doing the absolute best they can under the circumstances. That's wonderful. You know, we've got a couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask something because so uh, you hear so much that domestic violence is a woman's problem. It's a woman's problem. Could you, do you have any good suggestions on how men in particular can help to fight domestic violence in their community and around the state? You're bringing up such great topics. So domestic violence is for all of us to resolve and to address in our own communities and in our families. Uh, it's a societal issue. And so men are absolutely part of the equation in terms of how we address this. Men can be voices. Uh, they can be allies. Uh, they can stand up and, and not look the other way if they hear language or uh, view a, a friend or a family member who's not treating their partner in a way that would seem uh, okay, seems unsafe, to be able to say something. They can be role models and examples. They can also raise uh, young men, boys, to be uh, good partners uh, and to be healthy human beings um, and not perpetuate this behavior. Thank you, Karen. I, we're, we're almost to the top of the hour, and I see here that we have several questions. Okay. So I think we'll, we will um, go into the Q&A um, portion of, of our chat. I'm going to start out with this first question um, uh, from Lori. Um, according to the Violence Policy Center, in instances where men murder women, they are overwhelmingly killed by someone they know and usually with a gun. During this pandemic, we are seeing upticks in the gun purchases and reports of domestic violence. How can we A, inform women in Connecticut that guns do not make families safer and B, remove gun stores from the essential business list for Connecticut? Well, I'll leave the removing the gun stores to the essentialists, to the lawmakers and, and those policymakers that are, are making those decisions. Um, but guns in a domestic violence relationship uh, really create a very dangerous circumstance. We know that uh, the availability of a gun in a domestic violence relationship increases the chance of homicide by five times. We also know that here in Connecticut, where we average 12 to 14 domestic violence homicides a year, that gun conti guns continue to be the main use of force. Uh, we have been able to pass some rather progressive laws in our state, which take guns away in the case of an ex parte restraining order, a permanent order. Um, there's the risk warrant option uh, for victims. Um, and that's where I think connecting to a certified domestic violence counselor can be really helpful. They're very aware of how risky it can be to have guns in a domestic violence relationship. And that began, be then comes a part of the safety plan. Um, if that's the circumstance, then how do we uh, address that uh, with the victim? Excellent. So uh, our second question, what options does a parent of an adult child have if that parent suspects that the child is involved in an abusive relationship? Well, you have a couple of options. If you're in Connecticut, you absolutely can call CT Safe Connect uh, or go online and email and have a live chat at the www.ctsafeconnect.org because that resource is not just for victims. It can be for victims, but we've had family members, coworkers, healthcare providers who reach out uh, for information. So knowing it can be hard to watch someone go through this and you wanna be a support, it's helpful to talk to a certified advocate to think through how you might be able to do that uh, and to be patient uh, and supportive and know that they're probably grappling and going through some really difficult things. And it's just really critical for, for your loved one, whether it's your child or a sibling or a cousin, to know that you will be there if and when they're ready to make a change. Excellent. Um, we'll have a question here. Um, 
once a person contacts an agency, what, someone, what can someone expect to happen next? Can you walk us through the next steps that could possibly be there? So it really depends on the circumstance. Uh, and what I think is important to emphasize is that everything is victim-centered. So nothing happens that you don't want to happen. So for whoever calls or reaches out to a domestic violence organization, it's the conversation that you have for an advocate and no one is going to force you to do something that you don't want to do that you're not ready to do. They're your resource. Uh, they're your strategizer. They're your safety planner. Uh, and so uh, you will receive uh, support immediately. Um, it's 24-7. Uh, that particular counsel isn't available always 24-7, but know that there's a resource 24-7. Um, and they'll have all sorts of tools and strategies that you can use depending on your own individualized circumstance uh, to be able to achieve some safety and, and to help you be safe or what we call safer uh, in your relationship. Um, the next question is, my organization works with elders and those with disabilities. Additional complications include extreme isolation, abusers not necessarily a spouse or a partner, it could be the adult children, care providers, et cetera. Do you have any thoughts on this? So I, I, I keep going back to Safe Connect, but I do that because Safe Connect is the very easy streamlined way to get information, to get resources and help. So for example, in the case of elder abuse, Safe Connect advocates have a plethora of uh, resources that they're able to connect you to uh, and seamlessly so they can pass through a call. They already have maybe have a working relationship with someone within the Department of Social Services who works around elder abuse. And they'll have that skill set and knowledge base to help you because there's intimate partner violence, which is often what we're working with at the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, but there's family violence. And so it goes back to what you're saying, the child to the elder parent, two siblings, a parent and a child, whatever that might be but Safe Connect puts you in a place where you can have a conversation and then figure out what are the resources and the supports that are necessary. You know, talking about this brings to mind the wheel of power and control that I know people in the domestic violence universe talk about a lot, but could you tell our listeners a little bit about that and how that circle um, uh, portrays itself in people's relationships? So um, the power and control wheel, as you know, has been a lot around for a very long time. We've started to get away from that um, in terms of our training, because in addition to wanting to convey the uh, plethora of information around intimate partner violence, we've started this learning community process with advocates to offer critical thinking, uh, because we know that um, domestic violence is very, very complicated and it requires uh, some uh, skills and, and tools around thinking critically about each circumstance. But the power and control wheel is basically that cyclical generational side of intimate partner violence. Uh, and it's the, uh, the intention of one individual trying to just control all aspects of your life. So it could be gee, I, th I think it takes you 23 minutes to get home from work and it just took 35 and where were you and, and what were you doing and who were you talking to? Um, it can be, uh, you get this much money uh, to have and then I'm gonna control the rest. Um, those are just some of the examples, but it's just in all areas and aspects of your life, I'm gonna isolate you from your family and talk poorly of your family and try to keep you away from your family and turn you away from them because that's my method of controlling you. So it, it, it looks different and it can be all of those things. Um, but it's, imagine yourself in those shoes and going through that. Thank you for that. So um, one more question we have here. Are there some ways of working that you expect you will continue after the COVID crisis? Will you be able to reduce costs for some future services? So we, uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, there are staff uh, at the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence who've been tasked with uh, compiling what we call a lessons learned document. So we've been collecting data ongoing and information about the shift in strategies that we have been using um, so that we can understand when all of this is over. I think it's still gonna be some time, unfortunately, 
what are some of those things that actually worked really well that we hadn't considered before um, and how might we be able to connect with survivors in a different way and be very effective and keep them safe whether or not that yields additional savings is still to be seen but you know for example this idea of an online restraining order um, it's been interesting uh, we know that advocates within ct safe connect are helping with about 25% of all restraining orders that are happening right now. Um, how can we then build that knowing that there's that additional safety planning conversation that, and, and work that happens with a domestic violence advocate out in a community who helps you through that legal process. So um, that lessons learned document will be public. Um, my sense is toward the end of the summer and um, we're certainly gonna consider some new strategies. Excellent, thank you very much. I know that, um, one last question, I know that many community members like to help their local shelters. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us ways for them to help that can be useful and not be a hindrance to the local domestic violence agency, but to actually be helpful? Well, first and foremost, there are 18 sites. Uh, they absolutely welcome uh, help and engagement from their community. Uh, if you're unsure of which organization is in your own local community, you could go to the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence website, and there is a, an icon for you to touch on that helps you link to your, the, lo the local program. What they mostly need right now is resources. Um, they need that many of them had to cancel their spree, big spring events that support those unrestricted areas that are so important to providing services and help. So they need resources. They also probably need basic needs uh, for clients um, who might need gift cards for grocery stores or clothing and things like that. Um, but I would say that um, go to that local program. Um, you can find it on our website um, and have a conversation. I'm sure they would welcome that. Excellent. So Karen, I'm gonna share my screen here for a minute. Okay. Um, first, I wanna um, you know, thank you so much for coming. Of course. And, uh, speaking with us, I think you gave everybody listening some fantastic information. And I want to say for, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let me see. Hold on just one second. Hold on just one second. Here we go. Can you see that? I hope people can see that. I can't, but maybe I'm on a different screen. Yeah. If not, they could go to the www.ctcadv.org that has information about Safe Connect. It has information about the domestic violence organizations. Also, Very good. information about help and, and access to help. Great. I'm sorry. I had a little. I had a little um, thing there, but yes, people can. We we will also put the um, the state domestic violence. Um, a telephone number up on our website as well, where all of our um, conversations between um, are recorded and put up onto our we website. So they'll be there. Thank you once again, Karen. And I just want to remember, thank you so much. And I want to remember, uh, remind all of our viewers that the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame continues to make available our free educational programs to teachers, students, organizations, businesses, and people like you. And at the present, we're unable to engage in face-to-face -face programmings and fundraising, and we receive no state or federal funding and do not have an endowment. So it's through community support that we exist. And your donation at any level is welcome each and every day of the year. And I want to remind everybody that um, to thank you for being on today's webinar and that we invite you to join us next, next week when we present Lieutenant Governor Susan Bisowitz, hosted by our founding president, Gina Clonan. Uh, the conversation will cover Connecticut's response to COVID-19. Thank you so much to our audience and Karen, thank you again so much for spending your afternoon with us. My pleasure. Thank you.